Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Helen Hillix, as you know, and this is my dear friend and incredible Ignite Your Life coach, Christy Bemis, who's from Madison, Wisconsin, but works with people all over the world. She's a psychotherapist and a real expert in women's self pleasure. And I am so <laughs> excited to talk about this because when I was growing up, nobody talked about that. Right. And even, even as, as recently as just a few years ago, and even today, it's, it's really just, uh, from my perspective, just, just starting to be a, a topic for public consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I'm, I am focusing on sacred sexuality and so many people ask me, well, I can't learn about sacred sexuality because I don't have a partner. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them, are you kidding? <laughs> the most sacred beginning for sacred sexuality with a partner is sexuality with yourself and with the yeah. universe. So yeah. I am so thrilled to welcome you today, Christy, and I cannot wait to hear what you have to say. And I know I'm going to learn a ton. So yes, take it you. away. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. And um, I can attest to your work because personally being in your, your program for the last six months um, during a really transformational time in my life uh, was the exact support I needed. And it's taken my solo sex practice, which has always been kind of pretty yummy and delicious, but moved it into partner engagement. That's been <laughs> yummy and delicious as well. So, and I agree. I think, you know, our solo sex practice with ourselves and how we choose to touch ourselves and how we masturbate and the feelings that those kinds of things bring us um, absolutely informs partner engagement. I mean, it's been just life-changing for me to know my body more. And so, um, you know, think back to the first time that you discovered touching yourself for pleasure. And can you remember that time, Helen, for yourself? Like how you know, old were you? I would, yes, I remember it. And it, this is a, a testament to the fact that my early years were a mess was that I had been having partner sex since I was, a, you know, 13, honestly, mm -hmm. I, I hate to even say that. And I did not discover orgasm or self-pleasure mm -hmm. till I was accidentally discovered it at 19. Wow. 19. <laughs> but yes, I yeah. remember, man. I'm sure other women have that same story that they had I'm sure. sex way before they learned the joy of self-pleasure or even what an orgasm was. Right. Yeah. And I find that it's all over the board from anywhere from three years old, a memory or five of self-touching and, and then whether or not the parent responded with shame or, you know, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. oh, take that into your privacy. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I lived in a, what I feel like was a pretty open household in terms of the female, my mom talking about pleasure and self-pleasure and touch, but very repressed from my dad who was like, don't talk about those things, you know? And, and I just, I was probably 10, 11, 12. And my parents had this like really cool massager that I stole for my own personal use. And in fact, I think I saw one in like an antique store <laughs> a while back. And I'm like, oh, I, I know what that is. Um, <laughs> and it was like, <clears throat> when I discovered it, it became kind of obsessive. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I also remember a time right after my grandmother's death, I think I was maybe in junior high, where I stopped completely because I was raised Catholic and I was like, my grandma is in heaven now and she can now see everything I'm doing. And it, there was just a real big shame quality around it. Um, but honestly, it's just too delicious to stop forever. And I kind of got moved through that and got over that. Um, but I think recently self-pleasuring for me in the last couple of years has been um, the, the key component towards having a healthy relationship with myself and really getting to know my body and myself. And when I first was starting the journey of switching and changing my self-pleasuring to be about and for my relationship with myself, it was really around, um, I had been masturbating. I think other people can uh, attest to this, like a, a one-off, like one and done five minutes later, I had my orgasm, I'm done 10 minutes later, whatever it is. And it was just very compartmentalized and like over here, and a lot of times after um, reaching orgasm, I would cry because there was so much lack in my life around touch 
and living in a, you know, a, a sexless marriage around touch and things like that, that um, there was just a lot of grief. And so when I really moved into an extensive and expanded self-pleasuring practice and really a solo sex practice, I wanted it to be joy. And I wanted to end the, if I had an orgasm, that wasn't like the ultimate goal, but I wanted to end my time with a particular intention in mind. And often that intention was to smile and be in joy and be in pleasure. And that I wouldn't just keep it to five minutes. What if I expanded it to 15 or what if, what if a couple hours, you know, in lovership, we do that. Why, why not with ourselves? And so I think the first thing I, I think women should think about is what is your intention? You know, it's not just about, I'm going to touch myself and get off. I think it can be, I want to discover my body. I want to see if I can orgasm for a lot of women, they, they haven't even in their fifties, sixties range. Mm -hmm. Um, for some women, it can just be, I want to know my anatomy, um, to, I want to see how many times I can orgasm. Like I've had that intention before. It's like, let's see, like what's possible (laughs) in this practice. Yeah. You know, I love something you said uh, a few paragraphs ago about you wanted it to be about your relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it triggered me thinking about, you know, when you stopped because grandma could see you and the shame there. And I feel like what you're really talking about is not just your relationship with your body, but your relationship with your attitudes about spirituality, Mm -hmm. with your attitudes about relationships, with your attitudes, you know, about how you feel about your body. I mean, so many things can be integrated into that self-pleasuring, that solo sexual practice, as you were saying, that Mm -hmm. can expand you as a whole person on, you know, body, mind, and spirit. I, I just love that, that you're saying, it's about my relationship with myself. And so much comes up, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it definitely is a spiritual practice for me. Um, it's my prayerful practice. You know, um, I get um, intense, um, you know, downloads and and feelings and just messages about my own self-worth and, and um, my own self-engagement. And it's brought just a whole new level of myself in lovership practice. Um, The comments I'm hearing now, how confident I am, how in my body I am, like, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a little curvier woman and, and I feel like totally okay with that. And, um, and I think that's a testament to knowing myself, knowing my body and what's possible then to take that outside of that relationship. And loving yourself as you are. What a challenge yeah. for so many women. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll love myself when I lose 10 more pounds. I will love myself when I get a boob job. I mean, it goes on and on. And, you know, you are a living testament to, no, I love myself curvy, 50, right? Mm-hmm. 50, 50. yeah. 50. You know, it's like, and, and just getting started in a way. Very much. Yeah. I feel like, you know, things have been kind of on hold and I think women's pleasure and sexuality is often put in the corner as like naughty and on a shelf. Um, You can get to it someday when you have enough time, money, or energy, all of our energy is spent on other people, but we don't put any, any amount of energy into ourselves. And so when I know that my kids are going to be gone because that's one of the requirements for a really full pleasurable experience I have is for the kids to be out of the house. Um, then I'm, I'm like, Ooh, slot an hour in, you know, um, because now I have time to play. And, um, I think that's key for people to decide what kind of environment is essential for me. Do I need the house to myself? Can I ask for my partner and other people to leave if you're in partnership? so that I can have just this really uncluttered experience and, and, um, and solo experience for myself. Uh, Two questions I want to ask you, you know, one is we could talk all day, of course, about how the patriarchy has, (laughs) 
has impacted what you're saying there about women don't take time for their own sexual pleasure, that they're not even taught that they are supposed to want sexual pleasure. They are here to service a man and to service their children. And mm -hmm. so I just, I, I, I'm appreciative that you brought that up, that a lot of women are fighting that belief system that they've been brainwashed with for decades. Um, and the second thing is, the the uh, continuation of self-pleasuring practices when you're coupled. Mm -hmm. Would you talk about that and why that's important and how women can talk about that with their partners? Because there again, if you if you learn that you're not even supposed to want it, it's a far stretch from that to I would like you guys to all leave so that I can, you know, have some solo <laughs> sex practice for the next hour. <laughs> some mummy time. <laughs> there is a funny story. My daughter knows that I self pleasure because I talk about it all the time. My husband, my um, son would prefer not to know. Um, and when my daughter left the house one time, she could audibly hear me go woohoo. And she's like, came back to the door and said, I know exactly what you're doing today. And I'm like, absolutely. You know, um, because I want her to have a healthy relationship too, with all of this. And, um, I don't care if you're in partnership or not, you know, if you make the time, you have to think of it, like you wouldn't neglect your teeth. You wouldn't go a day without brushing your teeth two, three, sometimes four times. Why would you go without touching yourself in a week, you know, or, even daily, if you want, I mean, go for it. Um, you have to take care. It's, it's a health plan. Like it's your health plan because the chemicals that are released <clears throat> during, you know, high arousal, whether you orgasm or not are just amazing for your body. And why would you deny yourself that? Um, so just for your own self help health care, but also how it informs partnership, I feel like is the two main things of why would I continue in, if I'm in partnership and I can go for my partner for pleasure, why would I do this? It's different. It's, it's a different touch. Self-touch is a different touch. Yeah, I know this is a different conversation, but there's been so much talk lately about pornography and men, especially men getting addicted to pornography and women trying to stop them from that practice while they're engaged because it interferes with the relationship with their partner sexually. And I, I've worked with a lot of people for whom that's mm -hmm. actually very true. How do you see women's self solo practice as different than that? Yeah, I think with pornography, um, <clears throat> what you're witnessing there is not real. The sounds coming out of the woman is not real. Her body is not real. Um, there you can hardwire that that's where you're going to get your pleasure from is, is that on reality, self touch is all real. You're not doing a body double, like come here, here's body double Christy. It's me, you know? Um, and so it's different and it's, it's not hardwiring your brain um, to be activated by the unrealistic unre qualities that pornography has, you know, just the amount of banging that's going on versus the gentleness of touch that can be super pleasurable. Um, I think that's the main difference is how, how pornography rewires, especially the masculine brain and pleasure centers and dopamine and things like that around, around sex. You know, it reminds me of, you know, because I've also heard people caution women, don't focus too much on the clitoris because then you won't be able to have a vaginal orgasm with your partner. And I was reading some Betty Dodson stuff recently, whom yeah. I, she just passed away. She was such a yep. firecracker and an incredible revolutionary radical sex educator. And she was talking about that all, or all female orgasms are clitoral. Mm. That they, you may not have, you may not be touching the, the tip that right. people think of as the clitoris, but that there's so much internal structure that all, uh, you know, orgasms are clitoral in some direct or indirect way. And I thought that is so liberating because then there is no, there's no prejudice about that, that, you know, men get to know that women have orgasms clitorally, period. And then you can let go of that ridiculous assumption that, you know, somehow 
you're, you're something's wrong with you if you don't mm-hmm. orgasm without clitoral stimulation. I think there's an, in, there's a statistic out there, something like 17% of women will um, orgasm penetratively, like solo penetratively. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it's like, yeah. And the, and I don't think I was into my forties until I knew how big the clitoris really was that it's the tip and then the legs that go all the way, you know, up down your whole vulva and, and along that area. And, um, there's so much pleasure to be had. And if you don't actually experience that, um, how can you guide your partner to say, this is a touch that feels really, really yummy to me. And could you do that touch? Could I make that request? Right. Um, Dude, there's so yeah. much talk about self-awareness. Mm-hmm. It, it's trendy. You know, yeah. trendy. Everybody's in therapy. Everybody has a counselor or a coach or whatever, but there still is that prejudice against self-awareness, sexual self-awareness mm-hmm. makes no sense whatsoever. You can't have a relationship with someone else emotionally if you don't know yourself at all. Right. Just Absolutely. makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. And I would say that um, I've been on this journey for intensively for about three to four years myself. And a lot of the work comes from Pamela Madsen's back to the body work. Um, I do work for her as a coach and also just have learned a lot in my own practice with her um, around breath, sound and um, movement and touch the pillars of like um, sexological body work and somatic practice is that whole breath, sound, movement and touch. And if you can bring that into your solo practice, breath work, like breathing into something, not holding your breath as a woman, the arousal potential is so incredible. And, and a lot of women are really quiet. So Mm -hmm. in solo sex practice, if you could experiment with moaning or saying yes, or asking for what you want, um, in your solo sex practice, you're actually retraining your amygdala to like stand down the fight, flight, or freeze to like stand down and not protect you from something that's not even going to really hurt you, you know, in the end. And that if you can start training that amygdala during solo sex practice, it's super powerful. Um, And using movement, like a lot of times um, when I talk to women, they have two positions. They're either on their back or they're on their belly. And what if you got up on your knees and, you know, did your solo sex practice that way or, put a pillow under you and kind of elevated you a little bit, like what would happen with movement. And, um, for me, I even like, will dance around my living room before I even kind of take myself up to my bedroom. If I have a really luxurious amount of time and just using that movement to move the arousal energy and then touch what kind of touch, you know, soft touch. Are you going to play with toys? Are you going to bring vibration into it? Like, what are you going to do? And so, I feel like the four pillars of somatic work can be brought into solo sex practice in really delicious ways. And, you know, so many, again, this kind of goes back to the patriarchy, but a lot of men, I've heard this over and over, tell their women to be quiet, mm, that, yes. that, it, that it inhibits them in some way, you know, that they, that they are getting so much pleasure and it distracts them from their pleasure or whatever. <laughs> And, and the moving also, you know, women are taught, and one of the things that Betty Dodson talks about is thrusting, you know, how, and I know for myself that t- so enhances my pleasure when I move my hips. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a, a lot of times women are taught don't move because mm-hmm. it'll make the man have an orgasm too quickly or whatever. So there's just so many contrary mm-hmm. messages going on that inhibit women's expression. And I, I love the breath work too. Breath work can so move the energy in your body. Those are great, great points. Would you say them one more time? So breath, sound, your own movement, and just touch, playing around with different touch, different places. And just like we don't want our lovership to go right down to our clit, if your solo sex practice is clearly just trying to do the one off, get it done, move on throughout your day. Um, What if you practice just slowly lotioning your body and rubbing it all over? And for me, I use um, good old coconut oil, which is just so, you know, a lot of people are not allergic to it. There's very few people allergic to it. And it's just really, you're 
your whole body absorbs it beautifully. And we put lip gloss on our lips every day. Why wouldn't we put a little coconut oil even in the morning on our labia so that it's like, you know, healthy and beautiful taken I care of. I love that idea. <laughs> I am going to do that. I love that idea. Just, yeah. and it, again, it's just saying, good morning, vulva. I love you. Taking care love of you. you. <laughs> I, I care about you. I want you to have your needs met. Yeah. That is so delicious right there. Yeah. So do you want to move into toys? Sure. And like, I can show sure. you a little bit about what I use. And certainly Absolutely. this is stuff that, um, you know, I learned through, again, like my work with Pamela Madsen, with other people out there, like um, really taking the time to talk with me about it. And so I would start with like the coconut oil and just how that delicious warming up in your hands and then just kind of cupping your vulva and what would that deliciously feel like as like a fun um, kind of new experience that you could have. But I mean, I'm going to share and I don't want to freak anybody out or anything, but I, I use the good old magic wand a lot. Do you have one of these? I have a version version of it. I, yeah. So, I mean, yes, it's big. Okay. You're not inserting it though. It's all external and you can use it all around your whole body and um, it has four speeds and start with the lowest. Don't go high too soon, you know, stay low, let it build, let the energy build, turn it off for a while, bring back, turn it off, bring it back. You can do play around with a little edging if you want to, where you're not quite clicking all the way over. But once you start turning up the volume, it's hard. It, you can't really dial it back on those. So staying low and slow is my, my key for that. And then um, so many women have, have the, the eggs, right? Mm -hmm. I have not used this honestly for a really long time, but using it to um, keep um, internally um, supple, you know, our vaginal walls are made up of um, kind of the same tissue that inside of our mouth, right, is made up of and, and you either use it or lose it, which is totally true. I know I experienced that post-menopause when I, I went through early menopause at 35. And so I just thought that was for youth, you know, and my vagina is old and she doesn't want anything in there anymore. And it can't be bigger than like, you know, my pinky finger, whatever, totally false. Like, and so using this to kind of, um, you know, keep that um, elasticity and keep the health uh, and wellness going and, and tying a, uh, uh, dental floss, dental floss. Thank you. Non-peppermint on it is, is kind of a lovely, you know, you have to do that so you can get it out. <laughs> Don't want to get that lost up there. Yeah. Um, and then the other tool, which was pretty intimidating for me at first, um, comes in this beautiful box. And, um, it's been the key for continuing that like elasticity and it's the enjoy and it looks super intimidating. It's very hefty. I could probably take somebody out with it if I was in like a fight of some kind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's using, you know, even the smaller end or the larger end to keep that elasticity going and to enjoy pleasure and put with the the wand, you know, together, you can kind of use the vibration internally. And it's just is a lovely um, feeling as, as you kind of stay lubed up and, and really either gently inserted or however you want to play with it, but just experiment with what feels good for you. And Those are the, the main ones. The two ends are just whichever uh, sensation you want to have, the more gentle or the, mm -hmm. the more uh, intense. Yeah. And it's just got a, a feel to it. Like it's, you can hold, you know, ergonomically as we age, you can hold it really well and, and it just feels good that way. And, and it gives you kind of, um, a half to it that, that feels, um, pressure, you know, so it's just a lovely tool and I think you can get them anywhere, but other tools I have, I have like rope and feathers. You can grab a fork out of your, kitchen cupboard if you want to play around with sensation play um you know essential oils but i would not put any essential oils all down there but if you want to 
like use the smell diffusing in the air. Mm -hmm. And then I use a lot of music playlists and um, really um, dance, you know, use my whole, instead of just using, you know, one part of the bed, can I use my whole bed and really um, dance and explore? You would do that in lovership most likely, or, or at least that would be, you know, the hope or the goal in lovership is to use the whole bed. And so, um, you know, why not in your solo sex practice? Do you have some kind of ritual, Christy, that you use in the beginning to set an intention? Uh, you know, I, I do that. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, if you have some sort of an intentional ritual at the beginning to sort of focus your energy. Yeah, it's really the intention, the, the tool I use ritually every morning, which is one hand on my heart, one hand on my yoni, and just really um, feel into and have a conversation and um, the four questions I ask in the morning is, what do I want to be today? What do I want to do today? What do I want to have? And what do I want to feel? And so it's the same ritual that you can use for solo sex practice. Be, do, have, feel in this practice. And it really sets the tone, I think, for this self-engagement that you're going to have and this, this contract that you're making with yourself for the, maybe the next 15 minutes or the next hour. Um, and, yeah. and, and I just want to encourage the group and the audience to uh, consider what you need mm -hmm. in terms of this ritual. You know, for me, it was really important to establish that sex was sacred because I had had so many painful promiscuous experiences and abortions when I was young and so much shame and all of that. It was really important for me to establish every time I was sexual to have a sacred intention to, you know, to have the universe bless this as a sacred action for others. You know, your thing might be the exact perfect thing and somebody else might need something else completely. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like, uh, you know, to give people permission to to really think about what intention is going to help them expand through this practice. Absolutely. And um, sometimes I'll take a shower and I'll start listening to my playlist in the shower and then take myself to the bedroom when I'm ready. Um, sometimes I just don't and I just go, you know, right to um, wherever it is I'm going to have my solo sex practice. So I think... Um, the environment super important. Um, and yeah, setting the intention. And I love the spirituality piece of things, really having it be a prayerful time. And then after, you know, and when you're completing your solo sex practice to just lay in the glory of how your body feels right now. Um, and not to get up and, and just move about your day, but really set that intention in place solidly by, you know, putting one hand on your heart and one hand on your yoni again, and really repeating that intention back to kind of end your practice too is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I like candles, you know, I, I like romance myself. I wear sometimes lingerie. <laughs> yeah. It's my time to really play with myself. I love that. And, and it's, you know, it's playful, absolutely. And yet it's very sacred. It's, you know, it's, it's providing those sacred elements of music and movement and uh, candles and the right staging, so to speak, you know, providing an environment for love and pleasure wow. and healing and expansion and connection to the oneness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just love how you're integrating all the different elements into your practice. Mm -hmm. um, I've forgotten what I was going to ask you. Yeah. So keep talking. I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that women will take oh. away, you know, if I was going to share a recipe with you, you know, I would have no shame in calling you up and being, here's exactly what I put in my amazing banana chocolate chip bread. I hope what women can take away from having a conversation like this is take away the shame. Like, you know, as I'm talking to you, Helen, about, you know, my solo sex practice in my mind. And I, I've been doing this work for a while in my mind. I'm thinking of the five people who would shame me for talking about this. And I'm just like, go away, go away. I don't want you in my head anymore. 
Um, so I'm hoping that the more that we as women can talk about this, this pleasure and the healing that's involved in pleasure and just the fun pleasure for pleasure's sake, we don't have to have like a healing intention in mind or like something that's like altruistic. What if we just want a naughty pleasure filled intention in our mind? That's okay too. Like it's okay to just enjoy pleasure for pleasure's sake. Well, and to even stop thinking of it as as even possibly being naughty. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. even that, it's like, let, let that go. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, the universe gave us the, the ability to have this pleasure for a reason, mm -hmm. not to suppress it, right. but as part of the experience of being a human being. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I talk about this a lot, but I, it's bears mentioning many times is my experience has been that the more I allow myself shameless pleasure sexually, the more I can expand into feeling pleasure in everything that I do. Mm. And that I don't have to, I don't have to any longer think of it as I'm going to have this kind of pleasure, you know, this hour. I'm, 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 that's one kind of self pleasuring. And then I have the self pleasure of jogging in the morning. And I know you do too. Mm -hmm. Yep. You no, know, and connecting to my body and my, and I wanted you to, for those who don't know what a yoni is, uh, the it's, your vulva. The yoni. it's your vulva. And it's just another word, Y O N I, that people sometimes term, but you can call it whatever you want. That's right. You can, you can call it pussy. You can call it vulva. You can call it whatever. penis is the lingam. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just, you know, for those who may not have been familiar with that term, I yep. wanted to make sure they knew what you meant when you have a hand on your heart and a hand on your yoni. I think they probably could extrapolate that, but just mm -hmm. to educate further. Yeah. Um, so what about the whole topic of self-pleasure and healing though. I, I'd, I'd love for you to talk about that for a moment, even though that doesn't have to be the intention, uh, you know, usually or always or whatever, ever, but, right. but would you talk about your understanding of that? Yeah. Um, if you have, you know, trauma experiences in your life around your body, um, just this year, touching of yourself for pleasure's sake um, can be super healing for your body. Um, it definitely rewires, like I had talked before about your amygdala. It definitely tells your amygdala, stand down. You don't have to protect me around my body. I'm safe right here in my body with my touch. Um, and it also can help with like your cortex. We have a lot of stories in our cortex that's all around imagination and what sexy is and what a good body is or what pleasure is. And so you can do work um, through touch around even that as, as well to change some of those stories around your body. Um, but it also releases such feel good chemicals. Oxytocin is um, the chemical, you know, that as a mother, when you're breastfeeding your baby, it's what's connecting you to your baby. And so it's released during pleasure arousal and, and released it at higher volumes during orgasm. And we're living in such touch deprived times right now, I feel like. And so why not, you know, have a little touch in your life that's, that's safe and, and you, you know, for your pleasure. Um, so that's the healing. Um, and certainly there's, you know, a release of dopamine. So there's like a reward center piece around things where you feel more motivated and ready to go out and, you know, conquer anything. So it can be used as a tool for, for creative intention work as well. You know, I, in one of the summits that I did, I interviewed, um, Carolyn Muir and, mm. and for a podcast, I interviewed her kind of legacy partner, uh, Amrita Grace. Mm -hmm. And she talks about having used sexual energy to heal her breast cancer. Oh, yes. Um, so I don't know much about that other than I've heard people talk about it, but it, you know, it kind of generalizing from what you're saying about the pleasure and the, you know, it just moves energy in your body. It expands the energy in your body. So why wouldn't it be possible for it to, you know, send fresh, clean, powerful energy to some illness and, and heal it? I don't know. It has but, pain relieving qualities to it. Women use it during childbirth. 
in, you know, orgasm during childbirth so that it takes away some of the pain. And I don't, there's something there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It has all kinds of potential fabulous mm-hmm. side effects. And um, uh, one, one other thing I wanted to ask you about before okay. we, before we close, and that is what is your experience mm-hmm. about how to use self-pleasure in a way that, because I have also heard of women who become addicted to self-pleasure and then they are interfering in their lives by wanting that rush over and over again. And they, you know, interrupt their work and interrupt their relationships and, and whatever. So I wanted to have you talk a little bit about how to, how to monitor that, you know, how to notice how to be aware of, of how you're using self-pleasure. Yeah. And I think there's everything in balance too. You know, um, I've heard people, um, talk about their fear of using like a vibrator because then they'll become like somehow numb to other touch. I I can attest to you that has not happened. And I use a vibrator a lot, so (laughs) it does not happen. You still can, you know, be in um, partnership with somebody and, and feel the feels that, that feel really good through other touch, like hands, tongue, all kinds of things. Um, and so I think there's just a lot of myths out there to, again, to continue to, to keep women disconnected from this pleasure source that we have and we're walking around with. Um, and I don't know what would be, what would be unbalanced, um, if you have issues in your partnership, you're, you're having issues in your partnership. What are you doing to fix them? You know, what are you doing on your end of things to find the balance, um, in that? Um, and so I would say when it becomes recognizably off balanced for yourself, there has to be a conversation with yourself around that of how am I showing up in partnership and what am I Am I using this self-pleasuring to disconnect or am I using my self-pleasuring to stay connected and to show up in partnership? So, so really you're talking about just staying aware, noticing yourself. And because I, I have also known people who, for whom the vibrator did become the focus and they could not orgasm without the vibrator. Now, whether that's an actual thing or that's, you know, something in their minds, I I don't know. But Mm -hmm. again, to notice that, and if you notice that you are completely reliant on the vibrator and you don't want to be, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it if you want to be, but if you Mm -hmm. don't want to be, then expand your practice. Right. You know, let yourself explore other things. So yeah, take the vibrator off the table for an expanded solo sex practice and just explore some other touch, you know, with yourself. Um, Yeah. I mean, all in, all in balance. Right. And I, here's what I know is a lot of times it's, it has very little to do with the vibrator and has everything to do with the relationship and whether you're feeling safe enough in the relationship. If you're amygdala in relationship, um, sexual experience is firing. You are not going to be opening up to any kind of pleasure. Your clitoris can't even feel pleasure at that point. So it's a lot of times it speaks to not the vibrators being the culprit, but the relationship is being the culprit because you're just not feeling safe enough. And I learned a lot of that from you, Helen, honestly, over the last six months, how can I feel safe in my body in partnership for me to really open up? And to allow, you know, a, a, a partnership lovership into my life. Um, when I first was working with you, I had like an unsafe thought in my mind around this is, I think, what I want erotically. And you really challenged me and you were like, uh, is that really the way? You, will that make you feel safe? And I probably would have set myself up to have a really poor sexual experience with a partner. And I could have even blamed it on the partner but I opened myself up to what do I need to do to feel safe enough in partnership so that I open up everything that I have to offer, you know, emotionally, physically, and um, literally right. Open up to what's possible in a sacred sex experience. I'm so happy to hear that. And, and self-pleasuring practices are such an important part of establishing a safe environment for ourselves because then you know what you like 
and you know what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And then the next step, of course, is to say so. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's going against the patriarchy too, which again, we could talk about for the next five hours. Um, but the, the awareness of what do I need, you know, is starts with the self and the relationship to the oneness, and then you can expand it into a lover relationship, but you cannot do, you cannot start with the other person. Yeah. You know, it's so foundation is so fundamental that we get to start with ourselves and owning our own lives first. Absolutely. And um, when you look at um, like Jack uh, Morin's work, am I saying his name right? Around the erratic mind. And he talks about your core erratic experiences. I can honestly say one of my top five core erratic experiences was with myself, was with myself and that there was ingredients responsible for making it a super great experience that is replicable that I can like, replicate that in other times with myself or in partnerships. So yeah, starts with you. You know, it's, it's the oldest phrase in the book, right? You know, you got to love yourself first, but you know, you got to pleasure yourself first, but it's, yes. it's all true. And, and providing the element of safety, you know, if you don't know what you like, if you don't know what you need, you mm -hmm. are not ever going to feel safe with a partner. Right. B because you have, there is no self there. Right. So I, I love what you were talking about there. And I, I just, I, I, I know we need to close, but it's <laughs> such a rich conversation. I hate More to conversations to come. <laughs> yes. Yes. I hope so. Um, so, you know, tell us, you know, give us some takeaways here that people can say, okay, I'm going to focus on these. Okay. So focus on breath, sound, movement, and variety of touch. Um, focus on romancing yourself. You know, if you were going to have a date in lovership, how can you have a date with yourself? Um, and just really know the environment that you need to lengthen your own, you know, self-exploration. Um, do you need everybody out of the house? Do you need the lights low? Do you need to light candles? Do you want the sound? Um, you know, do you want a crackling fire? Like, what do you want, um, to experience in yourself? And I think, um, the, the other aspect of it is that sexuality, spirituality, and creativity are all, they go hand in hand. And so when one's not balanced, the other two aren't balanced. And so how can you, incorporate the sexuality, spirituality, and creativity into your solo sex practice. I love that. And one thing I, I, that I popped up in my mind listening to you was the, that everything you're talking about is treating yourself as a precious beloved being. Yeah. And that is something that women do not do easily. And I feel like mm -hmm. that's the essence of what you're saying is to treat yourself as a precious beloved being who has a God-given right to pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think of the word cherish. I've always wanted in my life from little girl on for a partner to cherish me like that word cherish and all the things that layers that come with that. And what I've really realized, you know, is I need to cherish myself first. And that's what this can do. I love that. Cherish yourself. Okay. All right, ladies, cherish mm -hmm. yourself. And, and men who might be listening to this later, encourage your women to cherish themselves. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Do you, you have anything coming up that you want to? Oh, yeah. I, I, people can always check me out at um, um, www.hotpinkyou.com or www.christybemismyname.com and find out events coming up. I have a five-day pleasure challenge I'm doing at the top of December and solo sex will definitely take um, a highlight in that if people are watching prior to that, obviously. <laughs> awesome. So thank you so much for taking thank time you. out of your busy schedule, Christy. You are a blessing yeah. to the world and Aww. love you. Love you. Thank you.